uh, we are here to represent Mozart cultures here and our main is to um, spread science to every part of the world and we are a bunch of students here and we do it uh, for voluntarily and uh, my name is Arsu and we are here today with uh, Hilal and Bashak with my friends and if you are ready I want to um, uh, ask you uh, the questions. Sure. Okay. Um, Hello everyone. Uh, we are going to interview with Professor Nane today about art and aesthetics, beauty, and regarding some uh, aspects of philosophy. And again, Professor, um, we are honored to have you here. And firstly, I want to um, ask you that, um, do you think that the contemporary studies of philosophy of arts can adequately criticize the commodification effects of art industry? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for uh, thanks for this opportunity to talk about uh, art and beauty and all these nice things in the world. Uh, so the question is whether philosophy is doing well in order to understand how art is being commodified. So um, I, I, I guess uh, it depends on what kind of philosophy you're looking at, but I think uh, it's, uh, it should be the job of philosophy of any kind to try to engage with what's been happening in the world recently. I mean, that's very true for all kinds of uh, important societal processes that are happening, you know, all the, all the pandemic stuff, it, philosophy should engage with that. And if you, we, we want to go back to, uh, to philosophy of art and aesthetics, that's also, uh, it's, it's, it's our job as philosophers of art or aestheticians to try to engage with what's going on in the art world. So if what's going on in the art world is commodification, I'm not 100% sure I understand what you mean by that, but uh, maybe it's just that there's more and more money in art production, which is definitely true. Then, then we as philosophers should really try to, try to understand how that works. Um, I can say something more, uh, more specific about how philosophy can or, or should, should do that. Should I say something more about this? Sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> Of course. So, um, so I mean, one, one important thing that, that I guess uh, aesthetics and philosophy of art should understand and should say something about is that how art is always made for an audience. Um, um, very little of our art production is not made explicitly for an audience. So, and it's especially true for, uh, you know, for expensive art forms like film or television where they always very explicitly try to uh, address a certain kind of audience. They try to cater for a certain kind of audience. So in some sense, that's, if, if you think of art production that way, then it's always going to be a really important aspect of understanding uh, art production to, um, to pay attention to the financial aspects of it. And, that's, and, and, and that doesn't have to somehow, it shouldn't mean that the important touchy-feely things are left out. I mean, I think that the, the way money figures in, in, uh, in this, in, in, for example, in how a film is trying to capture certain kind of audiences that would then pay for the movie ticket, that could also explain a lot of formal and stylistic features of the films. So, so one thing that I'm, I'm quite interested in is, the, is a new trend in, um, in cinema, in, in, in TV, even in music, of trying to capture very different uh, segments of the uh, of the audience. So, so, um, so for example, very elite audiences who are very discerning, but also kind of mass audiences, which is clearly financially, it's clearly a very good idea because the more people buy, buy your product, the more, more money you get. And, and so I think that there's been a lot of uh, interesting effort to, to combine these two things, to, to cater for an elite audience, but also a kind of a mass audience at the same time. Uh, and I call this, uh, uh, crossover culture, this kind of thing, is they kind of try to cross over highbrow and, and lowbrow audiences. So is this a commodification of, of art? I guess, I guess so in some sense, but it's also, uh, it, it, it also has its kind of stylistic and artistic potential. Thank you. Um, so the next question would be, what are the ob objective criteria for calling an object as an artwork? Are there any such criteria? Yeah, so this is, so in some branches of philosophy of art, you know, the analytic and Anglo-American philosophy of art, 
uh, in um, like in the second half of the 20th century. That's that was somehow the big question. So how can we draw this division line between art and non-art? I don't I don't find that question particularly interesting to be honest. I, I mean I think um, the one of the interest one of the exciting things about art is that uh, those things that we consider to be art those things that we don't consider to be art, the borderline between them is very fluid and it changes all the time. So there's, you know, 200 years ago, there were very different things that were considered to be art than they are now. So, um, so just, I mean, wh why is it an interesting question about, you know, that this is art and this is not art and how to draw the line? Given that in 20 years, probably that borderline is going to be somewhere very different. So if you think back 20 years ago, very different things were considered to be art than now. So I, I'm not sure that this is the the most interesting question that you can, can ask about art. Thank you. Thank you. And Professor, uh, is the problem of independence of the art still a living problem or uh, art modeled problem of the old continental philosophy? The independence of the arts, so like different arts being independent from one another, is that, is that a question? And um, no, uh, the independence of art is still a current problem of the art of art philosophy, or is it outmoded, uh, out of fashion, uh, th this problem? The, uh, the in the, but, but what do you mean by the independence of art? Uh, the, the art is still independent from anything, or is it kind of an independence of art? Is it kind of a uh, philosophic dilemma for for today. Oh, I see. Oh, oh, I see. Like in the, like political independence, something like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ah, oh, good, good, good. Sorry, sorry, I misunderstood. Because there's also a debate in um, in, uh, in a very old debate in art history about how different art forms are independent from one another. No. So your question is about independence from politics. Well, that's a big question, right? Uh, and I guess um, in um, in the you know, the Western world, uh, people somehow tend, they pretend that that's not an issue anymore. So that the, the uh, that art, art is not uh, somehow threatened by political influence, which I think is just false. I think in every, every kind of uh, society, art is very much uh, dependent on various political factors. And that, that actually kind of goes back to the first question that you asked about, about the, the importance of money. So just in, this, in the same way as you can never really understand art production without talking about uh, the role of uh, financial constraints and financial mm -hmm. considerations. The same is true for political stuff. So again, you can't really understand art production and, art and, um, and also like the experience of art without also understanding uh, the political influence, both on, uh, uh, and not just political, but kind of ideological influence, both on how you make art and how you uh, how experience artworks. Mm -hmm. And even in, I mean, I, I think that there's a, there's been a lot of movement. So you asked about con whether, whether like some continental aesthetics is more strongly invested in this than analytic aesthetics. I, I, I actually don't, don't think so. I think in analytic aesthetics, so Anglo-American aesthetics, aesthetics as it's done in, in the kind of tradition that I'm, I'm in. Uh, there's been a lot of really uh, interesting new stuff about how, um, about the political, um, influence of artworks and also how how politics influences art so this this kind of two-way interaction mm -hmm. between politics and art so mm -hmm. i think that uh, that's a that's a that's a crucial question uh, for anyone in any kind of intellectual tradition so beyond to uh, political uh, effects we can also say that uh, art is also uh, affected by the economical profits and the loss uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah they are right yeah, yeah, yeah that, these kind of movements and approaches. Okay. Exactly, and that, that's also, that's not really, I mean, that's not a completely different issue from the political influence, right? Mm -hmm. Political money, a lot in common. Yeah, some kind of top of the people who has economical power uh, also directs the arts. So they give a route to how to uh, root these kind of movements in arts or how to sell it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that can happen, but that's not the only kind of interaction there. So, I mean, he, here's what I think about the series art production, or let's put it up here, art production and politics, and money. And that's just kind of really rich three-way interaction between the, mm -hmm. between the three things. And you can't really understand one thing, art, without thinking mm -hmm. 
I mean, society is a big mess, right? All these things mm-hmm. connect with everything else. So, uh, so you have to somehow take them uh, in as a whole. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor X, uh, one of your debates, you say that the reason why we go to exhibitions, theaters and so on, is to get experience and BD is just one aspect of it. You say it's a mistake for aesthetics to be obsessed with beauty. Um, do you think that these obsessions about beauty affect artworks and make them superficial? Uh, good. What debate? Um, before you came here, we uh, read your articles and watched uh, every episode on, on YouTube. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, yeah, you know, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, so okay, so I'm a little um, yeah. There was this kind of some kind of uh, roundtable discussion about beauty. So um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure it's very healthy to be so obsessed with beauty when we're talking about art and aesthetics. Uh, you know, in you know, hundreds of years ago, people thought that you know beauty, the study of beauty that's uh, that's that's what we should study when we study art. That just um, if you look around. In the art world, if you go go to to the cinema, if you turn on the TV, if you go to a museum, if you listen to any kind of music, you, just, you, know, you click on Spotify. Um, I'm, I'm really puzzled by how much of what is actually going to trigger your interest is going to be going to have anything to do with beauty. Uh, so, so I think that we really limit the scope of our aesthetic interest if we only are willing to talk about beauty. So. So I, I think I mean, my, my, my view is that uh, we are engaging with all these aesthetic endeavors because we care about our aesthetic experience, the kind of experiences we have when we, when we, when we are um, watching a film, when we read a novel, when we listen to music. But these experiences, they don't have to be the experience of beauty. Uh, they can be experiences that are very complicated in terms of its beauty. Maybe it's uh, somehow it's beautiful and ugly at the same time, or it's beautiful for a bit and then it's ugly for a bit, or maybe the whole beautiful and, uh, and ugly uh, distinction doesn't even come up, uh, but maybe it's just interesting, or maybe it's something that, uh, that gives you some kind of uh, aesthetic kick that, is, uh, that, ma- that, makes, that makes it resonate with you, but not in a way that you find it beautiful. So I think, um, I just think that the whole way of understanding aesthetics and art by, by means of beauty is a bit of a dead end street. Or, or again, it, it captures uh, some subsets of some, some cases of, um, of, of art and aesthetics, but, but not all. So we're better off uh, kind of zooming out and paying attention to other, uh, other kinds of experiences other than the experience of beauty. Thank you.